Owen TV Fantasy Football League podcast. Joe Johnson across the desk. I'm Joey Tysick. And week one is in the books. Finally, we've enjoyed some NFL football. And now we're already into week two. And now we're just going through the motions, it feels like, of weekly fantasy football. Joe, how did your week one go? It went fantastic. Uh, I was going to say, though, I'm sure you can relate to this. Is it me or did Saturday just feel like an eternity? Yeah. Like, I was just bored all day Saturday. Like, I just wanted to go to bed early and wake up like Sunday was Christmas. Yeah. To sit down, turn on the red zone, and watch football all day. Yeah, I I was trying to sit down on Saturday because Michigan was playing Texas, which was a big college football game. Michigan got blown out. It was ugly. And then I watched Michigan State and Maryland. So I tried to, like, pass the time, but none of those games were, like, fulfilling Michigan State, Maryland was really good, but it took till kind of the end to really draw me in. So I wasn't super excited. But yeah, I, like going Saturday night felt like an eternity. So I tried to watch as many shows as I could, which is out of the normal for me. Um, and yeah, Sunday morning even went kind of slow. I was trying to do my usual routine of, you know, going through. I like to get up, kind of double check my lineups, and then I. Uh, get on the lawnmower, mow the grass, and then listen to a fantasy podcast or something. So that gets me to that that one o'clock window. Well, the the battery on my tractor died, so <laughs> I couldn't do that. So I'm like twiddling my thumbs for yeah, an right. hour. Luckily, we were going over to my parents uh, to hang out um, for lunch, so that kind of helped pass the time. And then we just sat and watched football. So yeah, my routine is uh, I go out, I grab a sub, uh, some snacks, some drinks. And uh, come back and just plop down on the sofa and watch Red Zone all day, which took us right up to the Lions game uh, the Sunday night, which was an absolute blast. Mm-hmm. I kind of felt like the Lions-Rams game almost salvaged Sunday because a lot of the games on Sunday were kind of uneventful for the most part. Yeah. But, boy, that Lions-Rams game was exciting and fun to watch. Yeah, and I think I told you yesterday, um, and I, I can't remember what the total ended up being, but – This is one of the lowest opening weekend touchdowns that the NFL has had in years. Um, And there wasn't too many touchdowns last night. I think the Jets had two and San Francisco had two or three. So that's right around what happened last year and which is right around the number of like 37 or 38 touchdowns, I believe. Um, Whereas like in years before that, there was upwards of like 50 some. Yeah. I texted you, uh, I think it was in the first quarter maybe first half of the one o'clock games on Sunday. And I'm like so many field goals. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that kind of uh set week one apart was games were won or lost on kickers yeah. in week one. Mm-hmm. They even, you know, in the other league that we're in the auction league, there's a lot of bonus points for kickers, but in our own TV league, not so much. I think there's a few bonus points in there, Yeah, but they still scored Double digit points. Yep. A lot of kickers did. They had monster weeks. Uh, Moody on Monday night, I believe, kicked six field goals. Yeah. Um, they were the difference maker, which is mm-hmm. so crazy. Yeah, it's insane. Um, you don't see that too often from kickers. I mean, every once in a while, it's it's bound to happen if somebody kicks a couple fifty yarders. But there was consistently a lot uh, the other day of just four field goals, five field goals. Yeah. And long ones. Was it yeah. Fairbairn who kicked three 50 yarders? It was like 50, 51 and 51. Could have been. Uh, and then Aubrey had the, a big game, which I, was expected. I think Chris, Chris Boswell for Pittsburgh had six field goals. And I think three of those were fifties. <laughs> oh, Here um, we are talking kickers. I know. Week one. That's crazy. Um, did you have any other like interesting takeaways, whether it be a team or players that surprised you week one? Or maybe the players that disappointed you in week one? Well, my biggest disappointment uh, was the Atlanta Falcons. You know, prior to starting the season, I may have mentioned this on one of our previous podcasts, that I was expecting the Falcons to come in. You know, Cousins played really well with the Vikings last year until he got hurt. And that seemed to be a factor starting week one with the Falcons is his injury seemed to affect him. He wasn't very mobile. Mm -hmm. He couldn't, like, throw off his back foot, you know, like or, you know, he just seemed to be affected by that injury. And I saw some replays that illustrated the impact that it had on him. But even that, you know, you think you'd be able to hand off to Bijan all day and then have him run and 
Bijan had a respectable day. I think it was 40 yards and a touchdown, but the Falcons were my biggest disappointment. I thought they were just going to put points on the board easily. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if this is a, a, a critique of the Falcons or a compliment of the Steelers' defense, but my biggest disappointment was the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing to bring up, because we talked about it as well, the tight end position that we thought was so deep, uh, basically all of the top tight ends were absolute duds. Yeah. I don't think any of them scored more than 10 points um, that I can think of off the top of my head. There was hardly any tight ends that scored 10 more po- ten or more points yeah. to begin with, um, and one of them being Isaiah Likely in the Thursday night game, which nobody really expected to happen. <laughs> right. Um, so the tight end position all of a sudden is like really weird, hard to say, and it feels like going into week two, we're still having those question marks that you think, well, was that just a fluke week one, or is that something to look at going forward? I think I'm it is sure. a fluke. Um, I think the the stud tight ends are going to regroup and put points on the board. Uh, obviously, there's going to be some tight ends that are going to be hot waiver wire pickups, like likely. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if he's on the waiver wire in our league, but uh, in a lot of leagues, if he is on that waiver wire, he's going to be a top target. Uh, I saw one expert say, if you feel that you need a tight end, uh, look at the new, uh, the Saints tight ends. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got my eye on uh, one of the Saints tight ends. Uh, I forget his name. But, uh, yeah, so hit the waiver wire. But I, I think the guys who have, you know, produced consistently over the years, they're going to step up. We're not going to. Kelsey's not going to have a, a down year, I don't think. Yeah. Um. So we'll see. But you're right. It was a weird coincidence that so many tight ends failed to produce this weekend. Mm-hmm. Was there anybody that surprised you this week that you can think of? Well, I, I, I think that the team owner that I'm most jealous of is the team owner who picked up Barkley. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and and hindsight, it makes sense. I mean, you know, Philadelphia has one of the all time great O lines, even with uh, the retirement of Jason Kelsey, but to have Barkley running behind that O line, mm-hmm. I'm like smacking my forehead going, I should have seen this coming, but three touchdowns and he looked youthful he yeah. looked re-energized so mm-hmm. I don't want to say he was a big surprise but I sure was kicking myself for not pursuing Barkley more aggressively yeah I kind of have the same sentiment I I was a little nervous because Philadelphia is not known for throwing to their running backs but they do have a good offensive line but how much is Jalen Hurts going to take away from that right because we did still see the tush push so I think there's going to be games where it still might be a little bit frustrating to have Barkley but just in general, like he's so talented to begin with yeah. that he's going to break off big runs. And we've seen DeAndre Swift have a decent season with the Eagles. We've seen Miles Sanders have a really good season with the Eagles. And those guys are, you know, they're good running backs, but they're not Saquon Barkley. So yeah. I, I assume Saquon's going to have a good season. Speaking of the tush push, you know, one of the reasons that the tush push is so successful in Philly is because of uh, Hertz's squats. Mm-hmm. And they say that Barkley rivals Hertz yeah. and what he can squat. Mm-hmm. So even though they lost Jason Kelsey, who always seemed to be the guy in the back pushing forward, if you have Hertz and Barkley trying yeah. to move that pile, forget it. Right. You're toast. They're yeah. going to get a first down almost every time. The only time they, I don't think they got a first down on the tush push is when Hertz fumbled the football. Yeah. Otherwise, a one yard gain is going to be a gimme. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, that was my other like disappointment on the week was that there was a lot of like rough quarterback play. Yeah. Just, and I think a part of it was in offensive line seemed to struggle a lot yeah. for a lot of teams. Um, so there was a lot of pressure and like outside of Josh Allen and Baker Mayfield, I guess Derek Carr had no case an okay day like he had three touchdowns but he only had like 200 yards yeah um the quarterback position just was not that great part of the reason i think is you're seeing fewer and fewer stars in this league play in the preseason um Mm -hmm. consistently they seem to be taking that time off they're more afraid of injury than getting um getting ready for week one and i think we're seeing that lack of preparedness in week one across the board in in almost all skill positions. Um, I think we see the effects of not playing in the preseason. Yeah. 
All right, let's get into the matchups then. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> we have to talk about the highest scoring team in the league, which is the Hollywood Blockbusters, beating Kelsey you later 158 uh, to 187, which is probably the biggest blowout of the year already. Well, we have the highest point total versus the lowest point total. Yeah. That's just <laughs> ugly. I feel like I need to apologize. <laughs> Well, and like you, you said, your top scorer was Jake Moody, which yeah. is wild. Um, the Monday night, I thought there was no way you were going to pass me. I know you had, what, five players going, San Francisco's defense, Jake yeah. Moody, Debo, Brock I, Purdy. I did have Ayuk in the lineup until fairly recently where I had been reading some things about uh, Ayuk. I mean, he did get that huge contract, but he didn't have a lot of playing time. And uh, I started to get the feeling that they were going to not rely on him. And I I was absolutely correct in that. Ayuk did not produce. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Debo was usual Debo. He had a touchdown. He was fun to watch. But, yeah, so all weekend long, Thursday, Friday, Sunday, heading into Monday, I was behind. Mm -hmm. That was the case for all my leagues. Yeah, I was behind. But I was fairly confident mm -hmm. that I was going to take the lead on Monday night because I had four players going for the Niners, plus I had Brees Hall going. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I didn't get home from work until about halftime. And when I looked at the score for the first time, again, I almost felt embarrassed because at halftime I had gained the lead and just never looked back. And, yeah. and unfortunately... Um, Marie uh, just didn't have any players going on Monday, nope. so she didn't stand a chance. So, yeah, uh, so yeah, it turned out to be a blowout, and uh, I feel kind of bad that that happened <laughs> in week one. But um, Godwin, uh, and I have Godwin, but Godwin and Evans together with uh, Mayfield throwing the ball, they looked unstoppable. Uh, if they double-team Evans, Godwin's going to benefit from that. Mm -hmm. If they cover Godwin, then Evans is going to benefit from that. Evans looked almost uncoverable when Mayfield dropped a ball along the sidelines in the end zone, and it looked like Evans was being pass interfered with, and yeah. still a hand came out of nowhere, mm -hmm. brought the ball down for an amazing touchdown catch. So I'm very happy I got Godwin, and I'm envious of whoever got Evans. Yeah, But uh, Godwin was a pleasant surprise for me. Um, Moody, uh, 26 points. And, uh, you know, all the other numbers weren't great. Oh, let's talk about Diggs. So Diggs, for me, was sort of a late-round pickup, and I was surprised he kind of fell to me. Now, I've never had Diggs on my, any of my rosters when he was a Buffalo Bill. Um, but, you know, they say that if there's a player to be drafted that's best available, you, you got to get him. And so mm -hmm. when Diggs fell to me, I'm like, oh, what the heck, I'll pick him up. And then I'm like, ah, I might as well start him. You know, he's on a potent offense. Yeah. He exceeded expectations. 21.9 points, two touchdowns. Yeah. So I am very, very happy. And I think Houston's going to be an exciting offense to watch all season. Yeah. It did kind of play into what I expected from Houston, though, because the thing that makes me nervous is if Diggs doesn't get that touchdown or doesn't get two touchdowns, then he finishes with nine points. Yeah. Now, obviously, you can't bank on one thing or the other, um, but you know that there's going to be some volatility in there. But because he's, you know, one of your last wide receivers that you got, like a 21, 22 point upside is really good. Um, and if he can at least get, you know, 10 to 12 points weekly, at least, then you'll take that volatility. Yeah. Now, on the other side of the ball, a lot of single digits for Kelsey later. Mm -hmm. Uh some usual big names disappointed. You can relate to this. Uh, Metcalf, yeah. only 5.9. Uh, Kelsey, 6.4. Amari Cooper, uh, the the Browns just did not look good on offense. Yeah, and Amari Cooper, I think, was targeted nine times. Yeah, 3.6 points. He also had a drop that would have led to a touchdown uh. at one point in the game. Um, but, yeah, I think that's kind of the – the way week one went, like if, if you didn't have somebody that got into like the end zone for the most part, 
there was a ton of duds in mm-hmm. between. There was not a lot of like 15 point guys for the most part. There was a ton of like single digits or like big blow ups kind of for the most part. Like even mm-hmm. CeeDee Lamb he had 13.6 points. And yeah. the, that was in a Cowboys win where they dominated. <laughs> you would think that if they're dominating, CeeDee Lamb is having a day. That's part of the problem, though, is if you get out to an early lead, then you start running the right. ball. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, the Kelsey Elater's team looks great on paper, and if this was a roster last year, this she probably would have had the double double amount of points. Yeah, but it's a different season this year, and mm-hmm. I'm sure a lot of these guys are going to rebound. I'm not ready in my other leagues. I have Amari Cooper. I'm not ready to bench him, or yeah. not necessarily bench him, but cut him loose. Right. I think. I think they're going to get things together. Now, unfortunately, the the quarterback for the Browns uh, has more accusations surfacing off the field, which could be a distraction for the team. Man, just get him out of there. Sign yeah. somebody else. I've but been he just it for signed years. a big contract, didn't he? So, well, his, they signed him. Uh, they signed him way long ago when his first allegations came off. They should have never gave him that. It was yeah. A, it was a giant record at the time. Nobody understood why the Browns did it. Well, I guess I do because the Browns are desperate. They've been terrible for years. They're yeah. looking for that next step. But there, in my opinion, there are decent enough backup quarterbacks that could get this team to the playoffs. Joe Flacco did it last year. Yeah. There's guys out there that you could do it. I know you paid him money, but at, at some point you just got to say Deshaun Watson is no longer who yeah. he was with the Texans. He's just a distraction. Yeah. Now, I will say that uh, a late garbage time touchdown helped save Ford's day, mm-hmm. and he's one of the lone bright spots on this offense that he played pretty well in the absence of yeah. um, Nick Chubb. Um, now, I don't unfortunately, I don't have room for him in my starting lineup. I have him on my bench, mm-hmm. but I don't want to bench Brees Hall, Kyron Williams, or uh, yeah. Pacheco. Right. So Ford's going to remain on my bench, but I'm kind of excited that he has uh, the possibility, the potential to produce and will definitely be either a bye week or injury uh, mm-hmm. fill-in. Uh, so yeah. he's not going anywhere. I'm going right. to sit on him because it sounds like Chubb might be missing more time than we thought. Yeah, I assume if Chubb comes back, it will be to make a playoff run mm-hmm. at this point. Um, so, yeah. But you do you are going to have to figure out your tight end situation. You kind of alluded to it. Um, Jake Ferguson did have an injury. They said it, it's not as serious yeah. as it looked. Right. He may miss a week or so. So um, I do have a backup tight end, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I'm going to hit the waiver wire, too. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I'll find a replacement for Ferguson. But I'm going to hang on to him, hoping that he'll come back in two weeks or so. Yeah. Um, all right. On to the next matchup. The guy that got outscored by you. <laughs> Me, the Melonheads. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like I said, it's always good feeling to beat Sammy in week one, keep him, you know, under control. And I won 150.98 to 120.06. And man, am I glad that I drafted Josh Allen because oh, he, he looked w- great. You know, at the end of the red zone day, they do a touchdown montage and Obviously, in a short amount of time, they showed all of Allen's touchdowns. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there with my jaw hanging open because he gave everything. This He looked like he was playing to get into the Super Bowl in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And this was week freaking one. He was giving up his body. He was hurtling defenders. He basically took this game on his shoulders and yep. won it, and he was very, very impressive. Right, and people are wondering if if he's going to have a similar thing to when Patrick Mahomes first lost Tyreek Hill and they came back and they won the Super Bowl. Yeah. Like, everybody thought Patrick Mahomes without Tyreek Hill didn't have enough talent, yeah. goes on to win a Super Bowl. Not that Josh Allen's going to lead this team to a Super Bowl, but maybe he's going to elevate his play because he doesn't have the weapons like Stephon Diggs that he used yeah. to and stuff that maybe, you know, this could be his year. He has something to prove. Um, I'm definitely hoping that for my fantasy team, but, again, he just did his thing. I think he did lose a fumble, which is kind of a Josh Allen thing. Yeah. But he carries the ball so much. He got two rushing touchdowns, which is which is huge. Um, I also got the benefit of having Cooper Cup with uh, Puka Nakua going out. Cooper Cup just eight. He had 21 targets. Yeah. <laughs> like, you he, never see that. You know, it's funny. You know, I had him. 
on my championship team in 2021 where he just, he was like a black hole that sucked in every pass that went anywhere near him. And then over the last year or so, he dealt with injuries and, and had to deal with Matt Stafford's injuries. Now, you know, experts were saying it looks like he's back. And my God, in week one, he looked like the Cooper Cup of 2021. Yeah. Just everything came his way. He snagged just about everything that came his way. And when the Rams get in the red zone or inside the 10-yard line, I always say this is Cooper Cup territory. And he took that one pass and just made it inside the pylon, typical Mm -hmm. Cooper Cup fashion. He was very, very impressive. And if him and Stafford can stay healthy, he's going to, he could be the number one receiver on the season. And and they they look like they're going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I texted Malik during the game. And I said, because this is when the Lions were losing and you're starting to get frustrated. And it's it, the same thing of back to 2021 where you're like, how is Cooper Cup always open? <laughs> how do we not just double team him, watch him wherever he goes? It's just something that he's always been known for and you yeah. never understand. Um, but it's good to see him healthy because he is so talented. Um, I just I would have liked him to not do so good against the Lions. That's always the hard part of fighting reality with fantasy <laughs> well you know i have cup in another league and it was a it was a perfect scenario because cup produced but the lions won mm-hmm. so you got your points the lions won everybody's happy yeah now you know it's interesting when puka went down you think oh geez now they're gonna be able to double double cover cup but the exact opposite happened mm-hmm. like puka went down and cup just just elevated yeah he took everything and, and it's like what do you got to do to stop this guy so mm-hmm. I don't know. Uh, you know, it, Puka had a couple of really nice catches before he left the game. But, again, this feels like the, the Rams of 2021. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I just had good production, like, across the board. Mm-hmm. Bijan and Jameer Gibbs, they played pretty solid. Bijan getting enough catches. Jameer Gibbs finding the end zone. Um, Mark Andrews, we're not going to talk about. I ha- <laughs> He's the only player I had in all three of my leagues. Yeah. Um, it struggled mightily, but everybody else did pretty solid. Um, and then Sammy, like his team had a pretty, pretty good day for the most part. Um, but he did see kind of the downside of those Houston wide receivers. He unfortunately of week one had the wide receiver from Houston that didn't do as much. He had Tank Dell, who only had four, uh, three catches for 40 yards. He did have a 19 yard rush, which is always nice to see, but didn't get much out of him. Another terrible performance from the tight end Dalton Kincaid one catch (laughs) on 11 yards which everybody thought Dalton Kincaid could be the number one option for Josh Allen yeah and he he very well still could be but week one didn't look like it now uh HN looked really solid he scored 23 points but I see a big red Q uh, next to his name I don't recall any word of him getting injured you know what happened to him uh yeah I believe it was later in the game um I can't. Uh, oh, it's an ankle. I couldn't remember if it's a knee right. or an ankle. Um, but he went down, kind of hobbling off the field at one point. Um, it's a little bit nervy um, because they do play on Thursday night against the Bills. All oh, right. Um, and I know Mostert was also banged up in that game, which is <coughs> partially why he struggled in that game. Um, so both Dolphins running backs missing practice on a Monday is is pretty normal, uh, especially when they play Thursday night. But it's something to watch out for for sure. Um, they have a couple backups that are all right, but it is a little nerve wracking when you have to when you see an injury tag on a guy that's going to play Thursday night. You got to make a decision pretty early in the week. Yeah. Now, before he got hurt, HN was looking pretty solid, and I was yeah. kind of excited because last year he didn't have his coming out game until you know several weeks into the season where he had that monster like four touchdown game. Mm-hmm. And watching him play in week one, I'm thinking, oh, we get to see a full season of this guy. So I hope the injury is minor, and I hope we get to enjoy watching A-Chan play the rest of the season. Yeah, and I think the big takeaway from A-Chan, which I, of course, was somebody that didn't really want to draft him because I was nervous of how they'd use him. They ran him 10 times. He only got 24 yards, which is way worse than he was last year, but he did get into the end zone. The big thing for me that they're using A-Chan is the passing game. Exactly. He had seven catches for 76 yards. Well, in a PPR league, that's so huge. Right. Those those numbers you would be happy if a if a wide receiver got those numbers. Right. So to get a running back that's, you know, maybe gonna be utilized so much in the passing game is gonna be 
great week in and week out. Um, other than that, Sammy left a couple points on the board uh, on the bench with Aaron Jones having a big big game and Ramondre Stevenson, but I can't blame him for he wouldn't start them over Jonathan Taylor or Achan, Josh Jacobs, James Cook. Like this is the problem with having too many running backs, Sammy. <laughs> is that your depth is so good, it's going to be hard to choose who to play each week. Now, it will be be helpful once you get into bye weeks, um, but having to try to make those decisions week in and week out is going to be going to be tough. You've got a quarterback controversy on your team. Uh, obviously, you scored 31 points with Allen, but yeah. your, uh, your Washington quarterback on the bench wasn't too shabby, so yeah. that's got to give you some uh, confidence that if something – Again, bye weeks, injuries, anything like that. You, you got a quarterback who can put up some points. Yeah, he really impressed me. I knew he would probably struggle a bit um, with the passing game, but he's just so dynamic running the ball. He had two rushing touchdowns and 88 yards, so gave him 28 points on the day, which is great for a backup quarterback. So, yeah, it's going to make me feel good that if something happens to Josh Allen or not or just in a bye week replacement that I'll have somebody that I can trust. And I, I like my bench so far. The two rookie wide receivers both had touchdowns. Yeah. Xavier Worthy had two touchdowns. You work him into your starting lineup? Man, uh, he looked explosive. Yeah, that that's maybe my only question is Malik Neighbors got targeted a lot, like I thought he would. But, of course, the Giants' offense is bad. And then Vegas, their offense looks pretty bad, too. Devontae Adams still got a good amount of looks, but... Yeah, I don't know. It, it might actually be a decision. Normally, I don't like to take out the stars really early, but mm. you know, when rookies are getting that many looks that early in a dynamic offense, I might have to take a look at it. And, and you've got it Rice here. on one side, you got Worthy on the other side. You can't double team those guys, mm -hmm. which means whoever's covered, the ball might go to the other guy. So yeah, I'm excited about Rice, and uh, and I think Worthy is going to benefit by having Rice on the other side. Right. Um, our next highest score was uh, Malik's sixth place showboats, which right now he's sitting in third. So I was kind of hoping he would lose because I think if he would have lost, he would have been right around that sixth place mark, which would have been <laughs> hilarious. Um, unfortunately, the big topic of the week, Becky is subject to. Christian McCaffrey, a late, late, late Monday inactive just before game time, Threw everybody off because all off season they had been resting Christian McCaffrey, saying he's going to be good to go by week one. He's looking pretty solid. They're just not going to practice him. You know, make sure he's good for the regular season. And then right away, week one, inactive. I'm in three leagues, and I looked at each one of them, and each owner that uh, has McCaffrey started McCaffrey. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that was the general consensus across the nation. Yep. Did McCaffrey owners start McCaffrey because like you said, it's Monday night. Most of the players have played. If you don't have his backup, you'd have to hit the waiver wire to try and find him the backup on there. So a lot of people with mm -hmm. their number one pick of the draft in most cases got a goose egg yeah. in week one. That's brutal. Yeah. Brutal. And some people are thinking San Francisco may end up getting fined because I don't know if you saw the controversy after the game, Jordan Mason was interviewed. He's the backup running back that had a huge game for San Francisco. And the reporter, I can't remember who it was, um, she asked him, when did you know that you were going to be starting? And he said he thinks it was around Friday. Friday? And so that brought up That's a lot of controversy. Terrible. Feel bad for the kid because he just had the biggest night of his life, and now people are already questioning well, why didn't the team tell everybody that this was the injury report because you're supposed yeah. to report on these injuries? I'm thinking maybe it was a miscommunication that, you know, maybe he was told that, hey, be ready to start or that you might be starting, but Christian's still going to play. We don't really know. There's a ton of nuance there. But uh, supposedly as well, um, it didn't sound like his coaches were too happy with his wording when, you know, he's just telling people what he was told yeah. and he may not think of all those rules. So it's kind of sad um, to see in my opinion, but yeah, yeah the, it threw everybody off. You know, the thing about McCaffrey is if you have a player who just underperformed in week one, there's always a chance that they're going to rebound in week two. In, in this McCaffrey situation, if I was an owner, I'd be very, very concerned because obviously his injury is worse than they've been letting on. And now yeah. you got to start thinking, 
how much time is he going to miss? Mm-hmm. Were they just being cautious by sitting him out in week one? Yeah. Or is his injury more serious? I would be very, very concerned as a McCaffrey owner. Yeah, and now now we have um, some conflicting reports, too, that I've heard the last couple of days of, like, one person saying there's a chance he could miss week two, but then other people are saying, no, he should be good for week two. Mm-hmm. So it's another one of those things you're going to have to watch um, throughout the week. This time, at least, he is a Sunday game. Um, I believe he's a 1 o'clock game. Yeah, he's a 1 o'clock game on Sunday. <coughs> so at least... In that fact, you can make a decision. Be it, There should be more options to swap them out. Monday nights are always the worst for late injuries because it's it's so hard to swap somebody out. So hopefully we'll get the news ahead of time, or even if we don't, you will have more options to swap yeah. him out. The other big story that happened on uh, Sunday was the Tyreek Hill incident. Yeah. We are like, what the heck is that all about? Mm-hmm. Where uh, apparently on his way to the stadium, almost at the stadium, he has this, like, supercar and I guess he was exceeding the speed limit. He gets pulled over by the authorities near the stadium. It looked almost like it was on the grounds of the stadium. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if he was smarting off to the cops or what happened. I guess he didn't have his license on him. Yeah. And they end up, they, they threatened to break out his window and drag him out of his car. So he, he got out of the car and they put him on the ground and cuffed him. Yeah. This is, the star Miami running back heading to the game yeah. being cuffed on the ground where fans and fellow players are like, yeah. is that Tyreek Hill? Well, a, another player, Calais Campbell, also got handcuffed because he was trying to um, figure out what was going on, but he was intervening a bit. Um, the video that I saw, I believe both parties made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Um, Tyreek Hill, after they uh, had him roll his window down, talk to him a bit, Um, I think he gave some information. I didn't know what he had on him. It's hard to tell in a video. Um, But then he proceeds to roll his window back up, and he has a pitch black tinted window. (laughs) So I'm sure cops were a little bit concerned not knowing what he's doing. He was being a little bit smart. I don't know if it was, you know, that bad, but he definitely was kind of back talking a little bit. But I don't – there wasn't a reason to throw him on the ground. That's where I was kind of like – I feel like both parties messed up um, pretty badly in certain spots. Um, but yeah, it was wild. And then he turned out to have a great game. Yeah. He was definitely motivated and they do the touchdown celebration where his teammate is cuffing him in the end zone. Mm -hmm. That was pretty damn funny. Right. And so he seemed motivated by it, if anything. And then during the post game presser, uh, they said, well, did you hear the, the officer was placed on administrative leave? And he goes, that tells you everything you need to know, yeah. which is Tyreek's way of saying that the, the cop overreacted. And, mm-hmm. you know, if Tyreek was speeding, you would think because you're at the stadium, if you recognize him as Tyreek Hill, you go, hey, Tyreek, you know, try not to speed. Yeah. Now, go have a good game. Right. For that to escalate the way it did was absolutely insane. And then could have gone a lot worse when you think about it. So, yeah. um, so we'll see. They're going to do an internal investigation to find out if things were handled properly. But it was an embarrassment. It was really awful the way that that was handled. Yeah. The other thing that I don't, I just don't like personally either is that you know the, the Dolphins put out a statement talking about like how wronged Tyreek Hill was, and in a sense he was, but at the same time, nobody knows how fast he was going. There's been reports that were saying he was going over 100, which I feel like he was. If he was over 100, it he would have been arrested immediately. Yeah. Um. So it doesn't feel like it was that. But either way, like he was putting danger to like local citizens as well. So it's like all yeah. around. That's where I just I don't like the situation when you see these NFL athletes getting into problems like this. Like yeah. they should not be putting themselves in these situations to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But unfortunate all around. Luckily, you know. He had a great game. He did lead uh, uh, the uh, the scoring uh, yep. for Malik's team, twenty six points. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lamar Jackson on uh, on Thursday night football, twenty five points. Uh, he was looking pretty good. Yeah, they didn't get the win, but he looked pretty good and got a lot of double digit points from his roster. Mm-hmm. Um, he did have uh, Williams on his uh, bench uh, from the Lions, who scored twenty four point four. Yeah, I don't know if you try to get him into your starting lineup, but uh, he uh, or Williamson, right? Yeah. Um, I see Williams on the screen, but it's Williamson. 
Um, but yeah, after that performance that he had, um, gosh, you got to work him into your starting lineup, I think. Well, and Malik has Puka Nakua, so he probably is going to replace him with Jameson. Yeah. Um, I can't really see him playing Keon Coleman necessarily. So yeah, Jameson probably gets right into that starting lineup. Yeah. Um, which is going to be fun. He looked so darn impressive and he was having a blast out there. He got the game ball after the game in yeah. the locker room. He said he had never gotten the game ball before. And then yeah. he said, I do not consider this game the highlight of my career. He yeah. has more games yeah. uh, in his sights, so well, it's going to be fun watching. And him. the other thing was Jared Goff got the, the Sunday night football. They always give out their, like, player of the game or whatever. And Goff gave his to Jameson, which is really wow. cool. Yeah. Um, Even though you got to give Montgomery some props. Yeah. I mean, in overtime, you know, I texted you in overtime. I was like, God, Montgomery looks fresh. Mm-hmm. You know, this is this is the f- you know fifth quarter, and he looks fresh. And that was sort of the discussion the next day was how fresh he looked late in yeah. the game. And the coaching staff credited his conditioning, saying that his conditioning is off the charts, mm-hmm. and he was moving the pile play after play. Yeah, that marched down the field into the end zone. So let's give Montgomery some props. He yeah. was really impressive there at the end. Yeah, and Becky got to watch him do it while he was on her roster yeah right Um, exactly unfortunately though becky she had the same issues that i had in two other leagues marvin harrison jr and drake london (laughs) marvin harrison jr the number one picked wide receiver that everybody was so excited to see had one catch for four yards (laughs) talk about disappointment i mean yeah yeah he's a rookie but you know this is the time to see who's going to step up and you know, they got a pretty good uh, offense there in mm-hmm. Arizona and I thought he was going to have a bigger day and I'm not sure what went wrong there. I don't know yeah. if it was the defense was a double coverage. I don't know, but whoo, what a disappointing debut. Hope yeah. he rebounds. These are the times that you try not to panic. Um, and like we mentioned too, the Falcons just struggled. So Drake London had a pretty bad day. I had both of those guys in other leagues. So I felt that pain, but, um, yeah, other than that, Becky was boosted by Dallas. She had uh, Aubrey, the Damn kicker for defense. Dallas, and the Dallas defense, which combined for 38 points for her, which we saw that happen a couple times last year where Dallas's special teams can really give you some wins sometimes. Yeah. Well, that's why I said, you know, you got to put an asterisk on this score because she only lost by it's what like 18, uh, 18, or 18 and got a big zero from McCaffrey. So yeah. what might have been had McCaffrey played or had she been able to swap him out? Uh that's a tough loss and that's mm-hmm. going to haunt her. Yep. So unfortunate, but again, luckily it's just week 1 and uh we'll hope better for week 2. And then finally, the last matchup, the closest matchup that came down to the end and we're not quite sure how it happened. Yeah, cuz you know, at the end of the the Monday night game, it looked like Tracy had just barely mm-hmm. notched a win. And then when I woke up on Tuesday morning, she had lost. So I'm not yeah. sure what transpired between last night and this morning. Right. Um, there, you know, uh, Ian had, uh, uh, had, uh, Wilson going and he was shoved out of bounds and then came back inbounds to snag a catch and they threw a penalty um, and that was the last time I saw him handle the ball. And that's the only player that Ian had going last night. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure where those extra points came from, but, uh, waking up this morning, he was probably as surprised as anybody to see that he had, uh, won by, uh, you know, a point or so. Yeah. And I don't think there was any stat corrections. I think those show up eventually, um, that I can look at, but as of now, it doesn't look like there's any. Yeah. Um, so maybe there was just a, a lag in the scoring for Yahoo last night when we were watching. Um, but yeah, it was, it was close down to the wire and Ian just snuck away by like one and a half points. Um, when we thought kind of all week that it looked like he was gonna, he was kind of struggling for a bit, um, because of Justin Herbert. And then I don't know, he just kind of clawed his way back. Uh, Tracy had good production from Justin Jefferson. He got his touchdown. She Rice on Thursday night had a great game. Mm-hmm. Alvin Kamara actually looked really good. Mixon um, was a stud. Yeah, Mixon was kind of my biggest surprise of the week. Um, he had 159 rushing yards. He looked 
faster than he did last year, per se. Um, and then Jamar Chase, we knew he would be limited, so he only had six catches for 62 yards, but for being limited, that's actually not too bad. Um, and then she had the disappointing touch uh, tight end, even Sam Laporta, uh, under 10 points. And then Chris Olave, he oddly was out of the mix, even though Derek Carr had a really good game. We also have to point fingers at uh, Joe Burrow. Uh, eight yeah. points from your quarterback. Cincinnati in general just looked yeah. bad. Yeah, they were discombobulated. You know, the holdout uh, had something to do with it. T. Higgins uh, being inactive had something to do with it. But still, I mean, Burrow's a seasoned veteran at this point, and mm-hmm. uh, eight points against uh, New England, who prior to the game, a lot of people called the Patriots the worst team in the NFL. And they they affected a lot of survivor pools. Yeah. And they held Burrow to eight points, which cost Tracy uh, a victory. Right. On her bench, she had Prescott, who only scored 11 points, but even that would have been enough for a victory. Yeah. But the scary um, part is if you look at Ian's bench, he left a lot of points out there. I know. Um, again, week one, you, you try to just stay with the guys that you drafted ahead. But Jaden Reed having a big game, 33 points, 138 receiving yards, a rushing touchdown, and a receiving touchdown. Yeah. The only question mark I had was starting Justin Herbert over Anthony Richardson. <coughs> um, maybe that was just a defensive matchup choice that he thought, you know, the Chargers playing uh, the Raiders, that maybe that was a little bit easier. And maybe he just wanted to see what Richardson was doing. But if he would have swapped those quarterbacks, it would have been a lot easier. It wouldn't have been as close. Yeah, and I agree with you. You know, there was a lot of excitement and buzz around Richardson, and he was a player to watch in week one, and I'm very surprised that Ian uh, left him on the bench because Mm -hmm. I would have started him just to go, okay, let's see what you got. And uh, he was very dynamic and exciting uh, to watch. And, you know, you have Indiana and Houston uh, playing each other, and, you know, they, they both can score almost at will. So... I'm a little surprised he left him on the bench. I have a feeling we may see Richardson in his starting lineup in week two. Yeah. Um, the other oddball was uh, the number one number one overall pick in our fantasy draft, Amon Ross St. Brown, <laughs> uh, 4.3 points, which technically, if you think about it, he scored more than Christian McCaffrey. So That's true. The, the pick was justified. Yeah. I mean, that was a head-scratcher, too. The, mm-hmm. I mean, in a snake draft, to, to pick Amon Ra with the first pick in the draft was a little surprising. I was hoping he would be able to say, see, I told you, but no, uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, Amon Ra is going to produce, but uh, I don't know. It just receivers can have up-and-down games, and um, Goff's going to go with the hot hand, and, and he's, the ball seemed to be – moving away from Amon Ra and yeah. his, his production suffered from it. And I think that's one of the things too, that I've pointed out a couple of times is like, that's what makes me nervous about good offenses. You just don't know who's going to have that big game. Montgomery and Gibbs had really good games. Laporta and Amon Ra, they both struggled. Laporta didn't do anything. Um, Jamison Williams had a really big game. So it, yeah. there's just so many options. It's hard to figure out who's going to be that guy. Yeah. It's exciting to watch on television, but it's right. frustrating in fantasy when yeah. your guy's not the one getting the ball and they're scoring at will, and it's like, well, I want my guy to get in on the fun. Right. Um, so that's the week one matchup. So four of us are 1-0, and four of us are 0-1. Um, but if there's anybody that needs to make any roster moves, do you have anybody specifically that you think you would be looking at? Oh, uh, let's take a look here. Let me bring up our waiver wire, see who's uh, there at the top. Um, I did hear that Hollywood Brown uh, might return to the field uh, in week two. Hmm. Um, and uh, the Chiefs are going against the 31st-ranked Cincinnati defense against wide receivers. Yeah, uh, I have Hollywood Brown in at least one of my leagues just kind of stashed on the bench. Mm-hmm. But with that dynamic uh, Chiefs offense, you got to look at that. Um, Lockett's uh, on the waiver wire. Uh, Addison got hurt, Jordan Addison, with the Vikings. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's something you might not want to consider. Yeah, the top scoring um, guys that are available from last week right now, Baker Mayfield, who had 29 points. Alan Lazard, wide receiver, had 26.9. Isaiah Likely had 26. J.K. Dobbins had 22.9, which – 
if you look on the screen, I starred him, so maybe that's who I'm looking at. Um, and then Jordan Mason, um, maybe if uh, the McCaffrey owner, Becky, All right. <laughs> wants their handcuff, Jordan Mason is out there. A guy that you really like, Alec Pierce, had 21.5 points. Um, and those are kind of the top guys as far as position players. Um, like we said, eight-player league, you're always going to have tons of options. Yeah. But I, I think if if you're a little bit nervous about your quarterback depth, uh, Baker Mayfield probably is going to be a really good option, especially it seems available. like if he's got Chris Godwin going. Um, so at least in our league, I think Baker Mayfield is available in a lot of leagues just because he's right on that that edge of being really good. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised fantasy. to see uh, uh, Zeke is on our waiver wire. Uh, they're going to be facing 32nd ranked New Orleans against the run. Uh, did you mention Dobbins? Dobbins had yeah. kind of a big game, didn't he? Yeah, I said Dobbins um, was the only guy that I have starred on my uh, yeah thing. So he was somebody that I'm watching out for. Um, I don't really need a running back replacement, but it's just right. something to always keep an eye on. Um, I don't think I'm going to hit the waiver wire in the ONTV league this week um, just because I, I kind of like my team. I think I like my bench. Um, the only thing I might be changing is my defense, if anything. Um, but... Yeah, there's there's some tight ends out there, a couple wide receivers, a couple running backs. So realistically, if there's you know any position that you want, um, you should be able to find somebody. Um, there's a there's a guy on the Chargers. I remember hearing his name uh, leading into Week One, Lad McConkey. Yeah, uh, he scored uh, almost 15 points in uh, Week mm -hmm. One. Yeah, uh, he had a touchdown. Um, yeah. He only had 39 yards on five catches. But, um, yeah, the, the Chargers offense, they are going to want to run the ball. But if they ever get behind in games, um, we'll be able to see them throw a little bit, bit more and get a little bit more um, more of an idea of who they're going to throw it to. But he would definitely be on my list. I like him. liked him coming out of college. Um, the other one I was going to bring up, too, that I kind of forgot about is Zach Charbonnet, the backup running back for Seattle. Ken Walker looked a little banged up at the end of that game. I, I think he has a questionable tag on him right now, um, but I, I haven't heard any updates. So that might be one to watch out for if you want, you know, somebody that's going to possibly be a starting running back and they're going against New England, who again, didn't look that great. Um, they just kind of snuck by because Cincinnati was struggling. Um, he'd be a really good option um, to pick up there. But, um, you want to look ahead to week two, make some predictions? Yeah, I think so. Uh, um, let me pull it up real quick. I, uh, I'm i going to be facing uh, Sammy in the green Buckeye. Uh, he is favored to win by about a point, which makes me laugh. <laughs> but that's going to be fun. Uh, going oh, wow, yeah. Him. That's supposed to be the closest one. If we could start Sammy 0-2. Oh, my gosh. Man, we'll never hear the end of it. Yeah. But – um. Yeah, does he, does he have any good matchups? AJ Brown versus Atlanta the Monday night. I always like to look out for the the primetime games. Sammy has a bunch of primetime games actually. He has CJ Stroud and Tank Dell Sunday night against the Bears. AJ Brown on Monday night. He's got Thursday night. Uh, A Chan against Buffalo with <coughs> Dal Dalton Kincaid on Thursday night. So he's got a lot of primetime games. Um, you're gonna have all the one o'clock games. You do have Sunday night. You have Stephon Diggs. So anything that C.J. Stroud does to Stephon Diggs will basically nullify C.J. Stroud, which is kind of nice. True. I'm going to ride my San Francisco players. I got four of them in my roster. Yeah. And I'm excited that uh, I will be going to the Lions game on Sunday, and I will get to watch Godwin yeah. and the Buccaneers come to town. Yeah, and that should be another fun, fun game. Could be high scoring. Um, you know, the Rams and Lions weren't as high scoring as we maybe thought, but Tampa Bay, another team that could score with the Lions. Um, should be a fun game. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, Buffalo and Miami should be fun. So you guys have a lot of nice uh, primetime games that you'll be able to watch Yeah, solo. Um, I'm going to be playing Tracy, and I am expected to win by prediction, 140 to 136 at the moment, so it's still very close. Um, I'm going to have Josh Allen going early on Thursday night, which is always – Kind of nerve-wracking for me um, just because you want to start the week well. And so I'm hoping that Josh Allen can get things started for me. 
And then I do have Bijan Robinson to close it out on Monday night, mm. as well as Devontae Smith. Um, so that's nice if I'm if I'm behind going into Monday night. Um, that hopefully I can get something there. Uh, Tracy does have Joe Mixon on Sunday night against Chicago, which should be a fun matchup. Chicago's defense actually looked really good. Um, so that could be a close battle. And then she's got a couple afternoon games. Um, Did uh, Chicago's defense special team score two touchdowns on Sunday? Uh, I believe they did. believe they did, yeah. yeah. That's you impressive. might be right. Um, like I said, I might be figuring out what my wide receivers are going to do. Maybe I play Xavier Worthy. They're playing yeah. Cincinnati, uh, who didn't look good. And Devontae Adams is playing Baltimore, so Baltimore's defense is so good. Mm-hmm. That might be a move that I make. Malik Neighbors, I might keep him in the lineup because he's playing Washington, and Washington right. got torched <laughs> by Tampa Bay. So if anything, if Malik Neighbors can't do anything against Washington, then Daniel Jones is probably a lost cause, and I should bench Malik Neighbors. But I think that's a that's one that I'll probably keep um, in my lineup. Um, Becky is playing Marie, and Marie is expected to win at the moment, one thirty five to one twenty eight. Um, Becky has Jalen Hurts going Monday night. And Drake London as well, which that's going to feel really good again because she can possibly make that same comeback uh, that you got to make this week. Um, She has Thursday night. She does have Jalen Waddle to get her week started. And then looks like Marie does not have any primetime. Oh, she does have (laughs) the kicker for Atlanta on Monday night. Uh, So she she has a little bit of something on Monday night, but she'll know her score um, after the... Sunday afternoon game. She's got a couple guys in that lineup. Um, so pretty early on, you'll be able to kind of figure out what that matchup is going to look like. Yeah. And then finally, I just keep resetting. Finally, we have Ian taking on Malik's team. Malik expected to win 136 to 132, basically. And we have Malik's got Tyree Hill going on Thursday night. And he's got Nico Collins Sunday <coughs> night. So a couple primetime players there. And Ian has Saquon on Monday night, which would could be huge. Yeah. Um, and DJ Moore on Sunday night. So two of his better players uh, will end his week. Curious to see if he'll make that quarterback swap. Yeah. Because as of right now, Richardson's um, projected to score more points than Herbert. Right. But he's going to be in another tricky situation. Herbert's going to be playing Carolina, who looked pitiful yeah. in week one. Um, so maybe that's a tough tough decision for him. Um, I did see Lamar Jackson has the questionable tag. I don't I haven't read what happened yet. Yeah. Um, I guess they're saying it sounds like he's expected to be fine. Um, saying just soreness. Mm. Um, so it might just be like giving him a day off, but because of injuries, they have to report it. Um, so he should be just fine. But that should be another pretty close matchup. Like I said, Ken Walker. He is questionable, and as of now, they don't have any updates. It is an abdomen injury, so that's kind of odd, Hmm. and those are usually pretty painful, but um, you'll have to watch that one as the week goes on, Ian, to decide what to do from there. I think he is is in his running back slot, so his backup running back would be Zamir White, which you would hate to have to replace Ken Walker with Zamir White. Yeah. (laughs) So maybe... Ian looks at the waiver wire. I'm not sure. Um, but these are another projected close matchups uh, for this week. And, and uh, Malik and Ian are both 1-0, and so someone is going to get their oh, yeah. first loss while That's the other point. one goes 2-0. and And then in the uh, game between Kelsey later and the Honeybees, they're both 0-1, one. One. so yeah. someone will get their first one, and someone will fall to 0-2. Yep be rough to start the season 0 and 2 but yeah and tracy and uh sammy trying to knock us off of 1 and 0 <laughs> um so maybe we can even up the playing field there It'll but soon. once again i would just like to point out i got a c minus i believe in our draft and for the first two weeks now it didn't play out week one but the first two weeks i have been the projected highest scorer in both of these weeks yeah i got i want to say i got a D or something on my draft <laughs> and I led the league in points in yeah. week one. So meh. Right. I don't believe in early polling. Yeah. Grading, grading. We need to change that scale a little bit, <laughs> but as always, we're running into week two and 
anything can happen. It's still early. No time to panic. Um, if you feel like you need to hit the waiver wire because of an injury or something like that, I would suggest to do so. But if somebody just struggled, don't over evaluate it. Yeah. Let it play out. And I would say once we get to like maybe week three, maybe week four, then you can start to have some worry. But these first couple of weeks, you got to kind of just, you kind of let it ride for a little yeah. bit, unfortunately. And, you know, and uh, trades make the uh, fantasy football fun. And so yeah. if there's, if there's someone you let go on draft day that's been kind of haunting you, if you feel like you need to make an improvement to your team, offer some trades. Yeah. It just makes things exciting and fun. And, yeah. and uh, you always have to work to better your team. You can't just sit on your hands. Right. The worst thing they can say is no. Right, exactly. And I am notorious for just throwing out trades all the time. I've been apparently backlashed for it a little bit, but um, I, I think it makes it fun and yeah, at the end of the day, somebody could say no, but you never know. Like, you may just not like this player, like a Marvin Harrison Jr. or Drake London or something, and you're just like, you know what? I don't want to deal with this stress week in and week out. Maybe somebody else wants to deal with it, and they can take the upside for it, and you can try to maybe get, like, a safer player that you feel yeah. uh, you would rather have. Um, or if you you look at my running backs, I have three stud running backs in my starting lineup, one in the flex spot, yeah. while Ford is on my bench. Now – I would expect any other team in the league to see that and say, all right, you're, you're over, uh, you know, exceeding in the running back category, mm -hmm. but maybe your weakness might be a tight end. Let's work out something for Ford. Like that's yeah. how you have to play the game, right? See where someone has an embarrassment of riches and see if you can take advantage of that situation. Right. Yeah, or like Sammy has like seven running backs. Maybe <laughs> maybe he might want to try getting a tight end from somebody for one of those running backs. Exactly. Maybe. Um, but, yeah, just throw them out there. Again, it makes it makes people have to interact with, with each other, which I think is the most fun. Yeah. Um, the fun part about fantasy football is to be able to interact, make moves to your team, hit the waiver wire, try to make trades. Because some people, you know, they just get complacent with their team, mm -hmm. even though they're like 0-4. It's like, Try to make right. your team better. Let's let's have fun. Let's improve. Yeah. And uh just make some moves. Unless you're dominating. You know, right. I've, yeah. I've seen in, in the past in fantasy football, like I, like two two year or in twenty twenty one, I was dominating the one league that I was in, and then people would offer me a trade and I'm like, Why would I mess with that formula if I'm dominating in every skill position? Don't go after the guy who's yeah. in the first place role. Yeah, it's usually hard for that because they want to keep their team. Maybe there's a couple of minor tweaks that they want to make, but yeah. yeah, for the most part, it's hard. Try to look for those people that are, you know, maybe struggling a bit yeah, um, or just need a little bit of a change on their team. But exactly going into week two, I uh, wish everybody good luck yeah. and uh, enjoy football. We have week one of high school football this week, which is wild. Oh, that's right. To think about. So yeah, the home opener, Lake Orion football all around. Good luck to everybody. Make those moves. Watch the injury <laughs> reports. And uh, we'll see what happens in week two. And then uh, we'll be back next week for the week two recap and uh, week three preview. We'll see you next time.